Yeah, uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Vaskin uh, Apkar Prudian, and I was born in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I'm uh, from January 1958, so I'm 63 years old. Right, and, and Vaskin, could you tell me a little bit of, about your family? How did your family end up in Egypt? Had they been there for a long time? Uh, actually, uh, I am a descendant of Armenian origin, and uh, my family ended up in Egypt uh, during or after, immediately after the First World War, when there were some uh, atrocities in uh, Armenia, and uh, basically as refugees and as uh, orphans collected by American missionaries in Alexandria. And uh, this is my grandfather's uh, generation. My mother was born in Alexandria. Uh, my, my father was born in Cairo and uh, they ended up getting married. And uh, that's how we ended up in Egypt. Uh, actually we were, uh, I should say middle class um, from an Egyptian standard point of view, we had, uh, uh, relatively comfortable uh, life. Uh, however, not very uh, excessively luxurious, but we, we had access to most things that usually middle-class people have, including uh, traveling, which uh, at the time was uh, a luxury. I mean, in the 60s, when I was a kid, we used to be able to travel abroad. And that's, I think, uh, a significant uh, component of maybe my cultural upbringing and everything else. Yeah. What kind of passport did you have, Vaskin? Well, we had the Egyptian passport Egyptian because passport. both my mother and father was, were born in Egypt. Right. And in my paternal grandfather's case, he uh, was the only of, uh, of my ancestors who was in Egypt before the war, before 1914. And as before 1914, Egypt used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, and Armenia also was part of the Ottoman Empire. So basically, it was the same country. Uh, therefore, as he was already in Egypt in that date, the Egyptian law, uh, when Egypt was became independent after the war, I think in 1919 or 1920, I don't remember, uh, the law allowed uh, all people who were at the time in Egypt to become Egyptian citizens. So that's that's how I inherited the Egyptian passport. Uh, right. We we had um, one of my grandmothers uh, never received the Egyptian passport. She had the uh, residency, uh, what you call um, um, Nansenian apatri apatrit passport uh, or apatrit uh, document. Uh, I remember vaguely that, it, that there was some difficulties for her to travel abroad because of that. Uh, but other than that, all the rest were Egyptians. Right. And, and what kind of work did your parents do? You were telling me a little bit about their social class. What kind of occupation they have? Uh, I, I would start from uh, my, my grandfather's maybe. Uh, my grandfather worked for uh, a few years uh, as a shopkeeper uh, selling things like chocolates and cigarettes and this kind of stuff. Then uh, he joined, during the war, he joined the British uh, army as a map designer because he used to design very well. And uh, after the Egyptian revolution, after the uh, 1952, uh, he was offered a job at the Ministry of Agriculture Again, basically designing the maps, etc. So that's uh, my maternal grandfather. Uh, my grandmothers used to be housewives. They, they never worked uh, outside uh, the house. Uh, my other grandfather uh, had a, a book store, but he he deceased, he was deceased in a in a. Um, um, how do you say, uh, uh, he became ill by typhoid and he was deceased uh, early. I never seen him. Uh, my father, for a few years, he was a teacher. Then he used to be a technical worker at Westinghouse. 
electricity related uh, projects. And then he ended up in the Czechoslovakian Airlines as a sales manager eventually. And he, he retired as a, uh, in, that, in that job. And that was basically why we had the privilege of being able to travel abroad because uh, from the airline um, job, he had access to free tickets or reduced cost tickets. And that was how we ended up traveling. <laughs> And my mother, my mother uh, was a housewife, but she also used to be a good, um, uh, how do you say, uh, she used to sew, you know, to, to sew clothes for women, etc. So that was like a, a, a side income for her, for us, for everybody. And where in Cairo you grew up, uh, Vaskin? What, what part of the city? Uh, we, I mean, my, my parents settled since their marriage in El Daher, which is uh, quite near the center, the Victorian center of Cairo. Uh, and uh, up till the end, I, I was born in that in that apartment, and uh, we lived all <clears throat> all the time in Daher. Um, and I I went to the Armenian school, the Armenian community school. Uh, in Cairo, we had two schools, and that was one was in Heliopolis, and the other was uh, in Bulak. So I went to that school, the Bulak school, uh, where we had a, ba a good basic language, uh, let's say, skills. Basically, we learned uh, Arabic, Armenian, English, and French. French being a little bit less uh, level. Uh, then I went to the uh, the old English Mission College uh, that was for secondary secondary school. Uh, at the time, it was already turned an Egyptian private school called El Salam College. But the basic uh, was the English, the British uh, English Mission. And uh, I also studied after that in uh, the Egyptian uh, University, Ain Shams University in the engineering faculty and I specialized in computer engineering. Uh, so I have a, a you know, graduation degree from that uh, college. So that's basically you know, my, my background at that phase of my life. Right, and you mentioned uh, the Armenian school. Was there a big Armenian community in Cairo? Did you, did you attend you know, Armenian community meetings? Did you go to the Armenian church? How was that part of your life? Oh yes, uh, the, the, there is still uh, a good Armenian community, not very numerous, not, not anymore anyway. <clears throat> In the 60s, it used to be a larger community. A lot of Armenians, they immigrated to uh, Canada, Australia, United States, and some even came to Brazil at that time. Um, basically because of the country's orientation towards socialism, you know, Gamal Abdel Nasser had that Arabic socialist uh, kind of uh, thing. And um, uh, we used to have a well-organized community life. Uh, you mentioned the church, school, the clubs, the sporting clubs, cultural activities, uh, newspapers. Uh, so I was really integrated in that community. But I also had since my school changed to the English mission, I had also a good um, uh, social, let's say, in a network with my classmates uh, who were both uh, uh, Islam, Muslim Egyptians or Coptic uh, Christian Egyptians and at university also. So I have a good network on both sides of the, of the coin. Right, and, and when you think of your life there, maybe your childhood, your youth years, is there any particular memory, memory that stands out? You know, anything you remember very vividly about your life there? I was extremely active. I had a lot of activities, really. Uh, I had a lot on my plate, let's say. Uh, I used to play football. Uh, I used to train like five times a week uh, at, at a club. I used to play uh, chess, uh, participate in some tournaments, amateur tournaments. I used to sing in, uh, in the community chorus, uh, both at church and in performances. I used to participate in theater performances. I used to write in the, in the newspaper, the community newspaper. 
So uh, basically, that part of my life uh, was extremely active. Um, and then uh, in the last year of university, I realized that I had to cool down all those activities and focus on, on my professional uh, advancement. Um, so after graduating, I found a job very quickly in Egypt. Uh, and it was a good one. After like a year and a half, I was offered a job in Saudi Arabia, uh, which uh, was a, quite an upgrade, financial upgrade. So I went there and I stayed five years in Saudi Arabia before coming to Brazil, basically. And that's where I acquired the professional skills that uh, made me um, sellable all over the world. And uh, that's how I ended up uh, receiving a job offer from the Brazilian uh, IPM in Rio de Janeiro uh, for a two years contract work with Petrobras, the petroleum company. Uh, because of my background and previous work in Saudi Arabia with Aramco, which is, uh, you know, another petroleum company. So basically, uh, that's, let's say, a very quick uh, overview of my background while in Egypt and in the starting years of coming out of Egypt. Right. So when you say you acquired the abilities, the skills, what exactly is that? Can, can you tell me a little bit more of the work you were doing in Aramco? Well, I, I was engineer, a computer engineer, so I had the technical, uh, let's say, academic training. And uh, my first job, actually, in Egypt was uh, technical scientific uh, program development. So I was really deep in that, into that. And uh, with IBM in Saudi Arabia, I uh, acquired the business knowledge, the business side of the, of the story, uh, as a support engineer. Uh, to Aramco. And uh, during over the years, I even became the lead engineer on, on the engineering team, on the systems engineering team, uh, about 14 people, different nationalities. And uh, I was kind of coordinating that uh, before coming to Brazil. Uh, on the technical side, I specialize in uh, supercomputing applications for petroleum exploration and production. And that's exactly was the skill set that was required for the job uh, at Petrobras, with Petrobras. <clears throat> so that's basically it. I also uh, have done some work on computer graphics and image processing, uh, again, associated with petroleum exploration production at Aramco. Um, and basically, I'm, I'm a generic, let, let's say at that phase of my life, I was a, a generic a technical person uh, with some very specialized skills in application areas related to the petroleum industry. Actually, I stayed all together 10 years in the petroleum field, five years in Arabia and five years in Brazil due to my first five years in Brazil was uh, associated with that kind of work with Petrobras at IBM Brazil, employed by IBM Brazil. Right, so when you got the invitation from IBM, what year was that? And, and how old were you at that moment? Uh, well, actually, uh, I was quite known within the IBM internal network because uh, supercomputing specialization is, is quite rare, rare. Not many uh, customers have that kind of equipment. So um, I was known into, in the IBM internal network from South Africa, Italy, Norway, people from the United States, they knew me. And uh, at the time I was already uh, trying to move out of Saudi Arabia because it was like four years in, in Saudi and uh, I was about to get married and I didn't want to start a married life in Saudi Arabia because I knew if that happens, I would uh, be stuck there for another 10 years at least. So that was basically the, the context. So I started to look for for a job at IBM here and there. I almost got hired uh, by IBM Australia to be based in Singapore, but that project was postponed in that year. Uh, then came the interest from IBM Brazil. That was in 1987, started the, uh, you know, the, the talks 
uh, everything we, with our internal email network. Uh, at the time, there was no public email, but <laughs> the IBM company had profs, which was an email network. Uh, and um, I had a, first, I had a, a meeting, an interview in Rome uh, with the Brazilian managers. Uh, they liked me. Uh, and after a couple of months, I had a look and see trip to Rio de Janeiro. That's when the visa process started and I got the job offer. And uh, the visa was ready by the end of the year. So it took like four, four months or so. Uh, it, it was a work visa, you know, the Brazilian law, the two year uh, foreign employment kind of uh, visa. And um, so once that was ready by the end of the year, uh, I started my personal plans. You know, we got married, we had our honeymoon. I got, um, I resigned my job in Arabia, you know, all these things. and. By late March, I was in Rio de Janeiro in and, 1988. Right. I was 29, 30 years old. And by the way, that was another point why I wanted to move um, in, the, in that range of age. Because when you change your country at a later age, you don't have time to establish, to, to become rooted in the new country. And uh, you have less time to move on with your career. So I wanted really to make that happen. And what did you know about Brazil at that moment? How did, how did you feel about, you know, moving to such a different country? <laughs> Not too much, actually. Uh, of course, I knew Pele uh, because I used to play football and I used to, you know, uh, cheer for the Brazilian team, etc. That's very common. Uh, I knew some music from Tom Jobim which is also worldwide knowledge, uh, known. I used to know that uh, Brazil as a country had defaulted and uh, used not to pay its debts. In, the, in those years, I think in, in the 80s, there were some, some <laughs> issues like that. Mm, of course, I, I knew the Amazon floor, forest related uh, stuff, but that was basically it. Um, I, I came to know Brazil during that uh, look and see trip. I came to know uh, Rio de Janeiro and I associated Rio de Janeiro very much like Alexandria. Alexandria uh, is, is also, uh, you know, on the littoral, on the, on the, has the beaches, et cetera, et cetera. But Rio de Janeiro was more fun, of course. <laughs> so basically uh, I got to know Brazil after I came to Brazil. It was a good impression, right? I mean, you got the real, you thought it looked like Alexandria, but it was more fun. Do you remember how, how exactly you felt, felt at that moment? Uh, it was a positive, uh, overall a positive impression, but uh, there were also some annoying, annoying issues, uh, like uh, very high inflation. You know, a foreigner was not uh, used to that. Uh, it's still, uh, with my engineering background, I had enough arithmetic in my head to do all the calculations needed for, for managing, you know, the inflation related stuff, uh, uh, just, uh, for, for, uh, a joke, uh, I came, I think it was the 28th of March in 1988. And on the 1st of April, my manager called me at IBM Brazil calls me in her, in his room. And he says, uh, Mr. Prudian, uh, um, I'm happy to announce that your salary is adjusted by 15%. So I said, wow, you know, what's happening? I only three days employed and I'm getting a, a raise. Uh, of course, in other places on, in the world, you get a raise like once a year and it's like 5%. But I didn't know that inflation at the time was already 16, 17%. So actually I was being uh, reduced in terms of... Uh, purchasing power. Uh, then I learned about, you know, all the things that the Brazilians know, uh, which is managing the money, uh, investing in the overnight investments at the banks, uh, controlling your credit card uh, billing dates and making the purchases in the right moment so that you pay in 40 days and, you know, the inflation gives you some advantage, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, that was an annoying issue in the start. Uh, the language barrier was, of course, uh, another thing, but that wasn't 
as much annoying because um, I was in IBM Brazil and uh, almost every employee at IBM knew to speak English somewhat, you know, not, not very fluent, but anyway. So uh, there was another thing associated with that, like after a couple of months, uh, my manager called me through his room and closes the door and says, uh, "Mr. Prudian, are you? How are you feeling? You know, in in your in your job now? You're in Brazil for two months, etc." I said, "No, it's okay. It's fun. We're we're having some uh, new friends. Uh, you know, our neighbors are good people, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And, and he says, um, "Well, uh, you know that your contract is two years and uh, two months have passed and." Uh, uh, what are you thinking of, you know, maybe after two years staying in Brazil? I said, well, that may be an option, but that decision would come uh, uh, much later. It says, look, if you want to keep that option open, uh, you have two choices. Either you start to speak Portuguese or you teach 180 million Brazilians to speak English. <laughs> so <laughs> I understood, you know, the message was quite clear. <laughs> And after a couple of months, I started to speak Portuguese, of course, all wrong. Uh, I learned Portuguese with my French background because the vocabulary of a Latin language, you know, French is a Latin language. And the Portuguese words used to be, for me, uh, French words with distortion, with some kind of accent. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I evolved in, in, in my Portuguese, watching the novellas and reading the newspaper, etc. It was an issue, but uh, it wasn't as annoying. It was quite easy. Uh, after six months, I was already um, confident enough to have a, a, a public pitch at Petrobras. Uh, there were like 500 people, uh, <laughs> a technical uh, Pitch, of course. I was introducing a new, a new IBM product. So, uh, and people appreciated that because, especially in Petrobras, uh, when uh, Petrobras is used to receive, you know, foreign uh, specialists, but most Westerners they never do the effort to to try to speak in Portuguese. I mean, they they learn a couple of expressions, words, etc., but not, you know. Uh, and my effort to, to speak Portuguese uh, was appreciated, highly appreciated. Uh, I made some friends at Petrobras. Like, you know, in Brazil, it's very common. Uh, on Fridays, everybody goes to have a beer and, you know, in a bar next to, the, next to where you work, etc. And I started to get invitations from the Petrobras people to, to join that. Uh, those, those are, you know, little uh, details of how you become integrated in a different culture, although you are from a different culture, but you you start to become accepted. You know that's that was a, a, a very good experience, positive experience. On the positive side, uh, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, more so, uh, Brazilian people are very friendly. I mean, it's easy to make friends. You know, at the beach, uh, at the restaurant, uh, your neighbors, wherever you live, and you know, just come over. Uh, to, to our place and let's watch the Ayrton Senna <laughs> beating uh, Prost again, you know, that kind of stuff or playing cards or whatever. So uh, uh, the, the social uh, environment in Rio de Janeiro was very positive. Uh, it changed a little bit when we moved to Sao Paulo because Sao Paulo people are a little bit reserved, you know, but Rio de Janeiro being a beach, beach city, uh, it was very, very positive. So basically, uh, that, that's how we, we, we started our life in Brazil, me and my wife. Right. And, and you mentioned meeting a lot of foreigners and local people. Did you also have contact with other Egyptians or other Armenians? How was that part of your life? In Rio de Janeiro, no. Uh, because, first of all, there is no organized Armenian community life in Rio de Janeiro. There, there are some, a few families, but not, not a club, not a church, whatever. Uh, with foreigners in uh, Rio de Janeiro, I had some uh, friends from IBM who were uh, expatriates, a few, but mostly our friends were Brazilians, locals, you know. Uh, then when we moved to Sao Paulo, in, in Sao Paulo, there is an Armenian organized community. There's church, school, clubs, etc. Uh, 
we started to frequent the Armenian club for, for a while, but as our children were born in Rio de Janeiro and they didn't speak Armenian and they, they didn't integrate well in that, uh, in that community, uh, after a while, we started to move back and uh, we, we kept friendship with a couple of people, but that, that was it. Uh, I, I never went back to the intense uh, community work that I used to do in Egypt. Okay, And also there was a big gap because five years in Saudi and nine years in Rio de Janeiro, that was like 14, 15 years of a gap. And my interests were different. My uh, career movement was exactly at the point when I started to become a manager, management career and executive career. So it wasn't also a good moment for involving in community affairs. Yeah. Right. And, and, and was there any sense of, you know, proximity with other Egyptians, maybe not of Armenian uh, descent, you know, Egyptian Jews or Egyptian Muslims or Copts, or, or you saw yourself particularly as an Armenian Egyptian? No, we, we had uh, a friend who was uh, a Muslim Egyptian. Uh, she, she, I mean, her, her family came, her, herself and her husband came to Egypt um, before us and her husband was deceased and uh, we, we had good friendship with this uh, woman. Um, but again, there was no organized, let's say, Egyptian, Arab Egyptian community. There were probably some activities around the mosque, but since we are not Muslim, we didn't get into that. Uh, I had some Lebanese friends, uh, both Armenians and Lebanese Arabs, I mean, non-Armenian non Lebanese people, but uh, I didn't really particularly seek to become part of a, a, a close community, a ghetto. Uh, I was already integrated in the Brazilian culture, and I had all kinds of Brazilian friends. When I say Brazilian, I mean, Brazil is an immigrant country. So you have Brazilian of Portuguese origin, African origin, uh, Italian origin, etc., uh, Jewish origin. So I had friends from all these different places. And uh, as my career moved into management, uh, also it, it, it's kind of a filter where you start to seek friendship and contacts and networking with people who are going to help you in that in that sense also. So uh, it's one thing to become friends with your uh, door neighbor in, in, in your, wherever you're living in, the, in your building, but it's another thing when you choose to become friend with people who, with whom you work, you associate customers, suppliers, etc. So basically I didn't, uh, um, I didn't value a community sense, uh, either Egyptian or Armenian, basically. Right. And Vaskin, did you keep any any connection with the homeland, with your family in Cairo, your friends? How, how was that? Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, my parents uh, lived in, in Egypt uh, until my mother died a few, a couple of years ago. And, and, my fa and then my father moved to Brazil with me. He lives with me now. He is, by the way, 101 years old. Uh, and uh, my uh, classmates from different moments of my life, I have kept contact with them. Actually, uh, we, we restarted contact after the social media uh, allowed that. I mean, the Facebook and, and everything else. Uh, I keep in touch quite regularly with my university friends. Uh, all of them are, are, you know, successful people, each of each in its own uh, position. Some of them have immigrated to Canada, the United States. Uh, uh, one guy is in, in London, the rest is in Egypt. Uh, so I, I have kept that, uh, that network. And uh, I guess it's important because uh, that's you, where your roots are. And you have too many things in common with where you, are, you were born and, and actually I came out of Egypt when I was already 25 years old. So it's not a, like I wasn't immigrated when I was a kid. You know, 25 years old, you already have, you, you have a, a personality, you, you have experiences, you have a shaped already vision of life, uh, which of course evolves later, but, but still there is some part of it which stays there. I have a lot of follow-up questions. I was wondering, for instance, how did your father adapt? He came two years ago. How does he feel in Brazil? At his, at his age, uh, there's not so much 
to to become adapted. Uh, my father has traveled all, all all over the world. He he has a cosmopolitan mentality, uh, and of course, when he came here, he was already 99 years old. Uh, so his day day to day routine is basically uh, tied up with uh, home, uh, television. Uh, he reads some sometimes when he's not tired. So basically, there is no any adaptation. To be made, uh, and he also. I mean, my my parents had visited Brazil, visited us in Brazil before two times, and therefore they knew more or less, you know, the country's uh, features. Um, so, I guess uh, he is not adapted; he is just replanted. <laughs> right. And how, how did you feel when you went back to Egypt to visit? How does it feel to go back to Cairo, for instance? I mean, the country must have changed these decades, right? Yeah, in different moments, uh, I, of course, uh, in these 30 years, we went back several times, visiting friends and family, and uh, we, we baptized our children in the Armenian church in Egypt, etc. And uh, in every moment, there, was, there were different uh, aspects. Uh, uh, during the Mubarak years, for instance, where we, we returned there several times, it, it was kind of a stable, uh, like nothing changed, everything is the same kind of a feeling. Uh, after uh, 2011, when the, the, the Mubarak regime was uh, toppled and then the, the Mursi regime was toppled again, uh, there are some uh, radical changes, you know, Basically, uh, in in this last time I went, uh, the, it was like two years ago, uh, there are very heavy changes in a positive manner on the government-related uh, citizen service. You know, like for renewing your passport or whatever, uh, everything is now digitized, everything is uh, quite easy compared to like 30 years ago. Uh, on, on, the, on the cultural level, uh, the, the younger generation of Egyptians are really split be between the uh, extreme uh, conservative Islamic and the extreme open uh, uh, Western. You know, there are the, 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 two, the two sides. When I used to live there, that was also the case, but the European kind of mentality was more in the cults, in, in the Christian Egyptians. Uh, and a few, of course, Muslim Egyptians, which were typically educated in Europe. But uh, now uh, I realize that, that that split is, is broader. There are a lot of uh, Muslim Egyptians who are more like Western mentality. And I guess, you know, the, the triggering point of that was the revolution that, they, that happened in uh, in 2011. Uh, the other thing is, of course, my personal friends, all of them getting older, and you, when you grow older, your interests start to, to move, you know, in different directions. You become wiser also. <laughs> you, don't, you don't end up in too many discussions, you know, you're no longer uh, as radical as you were. So that was really uh, a positive thing. Uh, on the on the economic side, uh, Egypt still has all the problems that it used to have. You know, when when I left, I left. Uh, it's the economic concentration, uh, not too many opportunities. The opportunities have to have a political, let's say, uh, support, because without any political indication, you never get to get something. And uh, a lot of poor people. Um, at the time when I was a kid, the poor people in Egypt had kind of a, a, an acceptance of their poor status, you know, uh, maktub kind of thing, you know, it's a fatalistic mentality, but that was already changing when I left Egypt. And uh, today, nobody uh, accepts being poor, especially when you are poor, because nobody, because all the doors are closed. You know, you, you never have a chance to prove yourself. If you're poor because you're stupid, that, 
that's okay. I mean, you 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 don't have the skills. But if you have, if you are skilled, if you don't get an opportunity to improve your social status, then that's a problem, uh, and, and it's an economic problem more than anything else. Uh, so basically, that's how I look upon Egypt. Uh, I think look, Egypt is a country and it's a culture with like several thousands of years of uh, <laughs> of um, heritage, historic heritage. And there are still things which come from the pharaonic years. There are things which come from the Islamic era, uh, the Roman era, the Islamic era, the Ottoman era, and, and then, you know, the later, the more modern era. I guess the Egyptian society is very stratified in that sense, culturally. Uh, yes, of course, there are football and there is uh, the, food, the, the, the food and there is the, you know, the dances and music, but uh, in terms of um, your view of what life is all about, you can find different Egyptians thinking uh, different kinds of things. You know, uh, you find components from the Pharaonic, from the Roman, from the Islamic, from the Ottoman, from and from you know local, uh, of course, Egyptian. So in in that sense, it's a very interesting place. Uh, like for instance, in in Arabia, when I where I spent five years of my life, you don't see that depth. I mean, the, you you see that all the Arabs are culturally uniform, uh, homogeneous, and they have their own you know beliefs, belief systems, and you don't differentiate too much between uh, uh, a Saudi guy from Jeddah or a Saudi guy from the Haram. You know, it's the same more or less similar mentality. Uh, but in Egypt, it's it's totally different. You you get someone from the southern part of Egypt and someone from Alexandria. They are almost like it's a different uh, from a different country. It's a little bit like Brazil, actually. I mean, you can compare a Brazilian from Northeast and Brazilian from São Paulo. You can compare them in at up to a certain point. Then you see that no, th these are two different mentalities, two different kind of people, etc. So basically, mm -hmm. that's it. That's how I see Egypt. Right, that's fascinating. And I was wondering, because you said earlier that, that you keep your connection with the, with the motherland. So I was wondering, what do you do at home, for instance? For instance, do you cook molochie, full? Do you listen to Egyptian no, music? Do you have any, any particular connection with, that you keep at home? No, I, would, I would like someone to cook molochie for me. <laughs> Actually, I don't cook. Uh, but yeah, I, did, I, I get some full. Uh, which is the beans, you know, the <laughs> the Egyptian uh, beans. I get it in the in the supermarket and I make it at home. Not very frequently, but uh, like three or four times per year. Uh, but that's that's basically it. I I listen to when I'm nostalgic. I, I listen to some music on YouTube, like uh, I listen to uh, basically Abdul Halim Hafiz, which is a a, a good singer in. In, in Egypt, Egyptian culture. Um, I watch some movies, old movies, you know, the, from the 60s and from the 70s, some theaters, but that's basically it. Uh, not very frequently. My own personal culture is much more Armenian and much more cosmopolitan. Uh, I enjoy music from, you know, all kinds of uh, cultures. And basically, uh, I'm, I'm not as Egyptian as an Egyptian who who develops his life without being exposed to the international. Like for instance, uh, when I was in Arabia, in IBM Arabia, my workmates came from 36 different countries. So I had day-to-day -day contact with people from the Philippines, from India, from Pakistan, from different countries of Europe, Italians, French, uh, Dutch, United States. And my mentors were from different places. Like my, my first manager mentor was a Swedish guy. Uh, then I was assigned to a Pakistani. Then uh, still when I was a junior professional, then I worked with uh, several Americans as my mentors, as my developers, let's say. So 
I, ha I have very cosmopolitan uh, in my day-to-day -day life at home. I have kept more things Armenian than Egyptian. That's for sure I can tell. But for instance, my kids are Brazilian. They they don't have that connection either with Egypt or or with Armenia. So, right? Could you give me an example of something something Armenian? Let's say that you, that you do frequently or that you you know that helps you oh, connect I listen, with. I your... listen to Armenian music every day, right. and 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 I follow the news. My my news feed uh, on Facebook is basically the, whatever happens in Armenia, <laughs> and sometimes whatever happens in Brazil, and <laughs> and sometimes. Uh, whatever happens in Egypt, but mainly, mainly, I mean, you know, the, the 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 artificial intelligence bots that decide what would be your interest, like the Facebook algorithms, they decide that uh, I'm more interested in things happening in Armenia. <laughs> so basically, that's uh, uh, and and that's true. That's true. Right, and I guess I had a last question because you said in the beginning that when you got to Rio, you thought it looked like Alexandria, right? So I was wondering how you compare today your life in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, with your life in, in, in Cairo. How, how different is that? Of course, Rio de Janeiro has really, uh, because of the, of the beaches, etc., has uh, typical um, littoral city life. And uh, that comparison with Alexandria was, was very... Uh, very correct. But Sao Paulo has nothing near Cairo. Sao Paulo is a, is a large cosmopolitan city. Somewhat, the Sao Paulo people have a, a conservative and interior mentality. Uh, but because it's a very large city, you know, like, I don't know, 10 million population, maybe, maybe more, there is a lot of variety. So in Sao Paulo, like if you're interested in theater, you can go to all kinds of theater, from experimental to amateur to Broadway shows. Uh, if you're interested in movies, you can have you know the same thing. You can go to cult. You can go to you know commercial uh, Hollywood movies, etc. Uh, restaurants. You can find almost every kind of food in in Sao Paulo. You know, good Indian restaurants, good Italian restaurants, etc. So basically, Sao Paulo is not like Cairo in certain sense. Of course, Cairo has a cosmopolitan part also, but it's, it's more limited. <clears throat> um, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm much more Brazilian than anything else. I mean, when you go shopping, when you go to the movies, you go to restaurants, etc., I do the same things that a typical Brazilian use would do you know uh, i go to a football match uh, at the stadium uh, while in cairo also there is a difference because um at that phase of my life i was still student you know when i graduated i i spent like less than two years working in cairo my work experience my professional experience is saudi then brazil and uh, and again, mostly I have worked with different kinds of nationalities because in Saudi I used to deal with uh, you know all those uh, cosmopolitan environments. Uh, Aramco, which used to be my customer, is typical American uh, business, big business. Uh, then, while in Brazil, of course, with Brazilians, with Latins, uh, with IBM Brazil. Uh, a couple of years, I had Latin American responsibility, which got me exposed to the Mexicans and Argentinians and Chileans, uh, etc. Uh, after IBM, I moved to uh, Hitachi, so it's a Japanese culture. Then to ThyssenKrupp, which is German culture, and after all that, you know, all the, that international experience and exposure, I started my own business. So. Uh, I am quite cosmopolitan in my personal culture. Uh, and I don't seek, other than nostalgic moments, I don't seek my root cultures. Uh, the Armenian part, which I mentioned, is something which comes as a, a little preference 
because of all those you know early years activities with the community with theater with chorus etc but um, I, I i i mean i can live without it also okay basically that's it and my personal interests have evolved a lot uh, i started to read books about different things not only uh, you know exact sciences because when you move into management you figure out that management is far and far most is psychology you're dealing with people you're dealing with their value system their decision making system their emotions and so i started to learn about those things reading books about that and also being trained because you know, the, the management switch happened in IBM and IBM used to train us very well. So basically, uh, at this point of my life, I can say that I'm a, I'm a quite cosmopolitan person. But again, there is the Brazilian part, there is the Egyptian part, there is the Armenian part also. Three hats. <laughs> And with that said, is there anything you would like to add? Maybe I forgot to ask you something that you think is important for people to know about you, about your life in Egypt, about your Armenian roots. Is there anything to add? Uh, the, the interesting question is the following. Where would you retire? I mean, would you go back to Egypt to retire? I mean, for a retiree who has no money problems, Egypt is, is wonderful. I mean, you go to the beach and, you know, you live a very nice life. And, and Brazil is, is more complicated because basically the, the only thing that annoys us in Brazil is the security, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, we pay taxes, but we don't receive, you know, quite uh, security from the government. And we don't receive any other thing also. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe I would like to retire in a Mediterranean place. It could be south of Italy, Greece, uh, south of Spain, Portugal, I don't know. But th that's, that's something which uh, typically an immigrant person who has already moved through different countries doesn't put any barriers to decide like that you know however if i had all my life in egypt most probably i wouldn't like to retire in a different different place you know you're not you're not used to it becomes more very difficult for that for such a decision so basically that's that's my vision on you know what an immigrant is and uh, and how you should look upon the challenges that you face. You should always be positive and you should try to integrate with whatever culture is there because you're, you're minority and you, you cannot you know, change, change the other way around. So basically this is it.